Did I know what I was talking about? I think we're about making that up. We lost Charles? I got him. Well, I think we're I think we're about ready to get started. This is a uh, if if I could get the speakers and uh, the podium. Um, this is a very very high energy crowd and a very very high energy panel this evening. I'm really proud to be here. This is a uh, history for sure. And you're going to hear an awful lot about that. I'd like to tell you a little bit before we begin and make our introductions about the museum, and I'm going to introduce uh, one of our trustees, Lynn Schustek, in a moment. But I want to give you a little synopsis of, of all the exciting things that are happening uh, that I'm going to leave pretty much for Len. But we're doing some very interesting transitions right now, as you know. Right up the road from here, a block and a half, 1401 North Shoreline Boulevard, is our new home. Uh, and we're in the transition of moving some of our artifacts in there as we speak. And it's a very exciting time for us. You'll hear a little bit more about that, but uh, and there'll be plenty of opportunities to, uh, to go forward in the future with the things that we're going to have. We'll tell you a little bit about that in a moment. First, I want to really thank Microsoft uh, for the wonderful team of people, Bill Morgan and his folks, for sponsoring this event here at Microsoft and sponsoring the reception. I'd like to give them a really great round of applause. It's, it's people like Bill, it's people like Microsoft, it's people like the other companies that have really helped us uh, to go forward, and all the individuals, and every, each and every one of you and our members that have really, really made a difference. And as you know, it's a fairly tough economic time for us all, and we're struggling through that as best that we can. We're looking at some new business models ourselves, one for our lecture series. We're going to be, be probably uh, charging uh, some of our non-members a small nominal fee to get into our lectures the way we're going to be working in the future. You'll hear more about that over the next couple of months as we open uh, our new facility. I wanted to just very briefly show you some of our upcoming events because they're as exciting as, as tonight. Um, we're sponsoring with the San, uh, Software Development Forum a lecture with Alan Kay on April 24th. Uh, our museum phase one open house, uh, which will be by invitation, um, will be June 2nd. Uh, that'll be our first phase of several phases over several years uh, that we're going to go forward with. And I think you're going to be really excited to see our new auditorium and our new visible storage. And then we have another blockbuster panel on June 10th. Scott Cook, Trip Hawkins, Doug Carlston with Stuart Alsup talking about a look back at the beginnings of consumer software. Uh, for the software audience I know that is here, we'll really have a great, great time with this. I hope each and every one of you can be there to hear it. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee is going to be here with a lecture on inventing the World Wide Web uh, on, on October 22nd. And keep in mind uh, the Fellows Award Banquet, which will be October 21st. Now, I obviously have not shown you all the things we're going to have from September, October, and November. Uh, that will be announced very shortly, probably when our new uh, building comes into play. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Len Schustick, who's chairman of our board of trustees. I hope everyone in this room knows him. Um, he's an incredible man with a vision and passion for this particular uh, preserving computing history and is really making it all happen with he and the board of trustees. So Len, let me turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, John. It's great to, to see you all today. I, I feel sometimes like I should start with an apology to people who come to every lecture because we always start with a pitch for the museum. But it's amazing how many people have not been here before or haven't been here for a while. In fact, show of hands of the people who haven't been to a lecture for the Computer History Museum in the last year even. That's half the audience. So we've got to tell you at least what we're about. For those of you who don't know, we are the reincarnation of what used to be the Computer Museum in Boston, which was the country's and even the world's only computer museum. It was started in the 1970s by Gwen and Gordon Bell and others. Gwen and Gordon are in the audience here tonight. Uh, and uh, had a facility on the wharf uh, in downtown Boston. And uh, eventually became uh, not so much a history museum as a kids museum teaching them about computers. What we did to preserve the history mission was to move the collection that they had established there, which was the largest collection in the world of computer artifacts, back to the West Coast in 1996. 
And in 1999, the Computer Museum in Boston actually dissolved. The corporation was shut down. The kids' stuff moved into the Museum of Science in Boston, so it was preserved. So those of you who remember the big walkthrough computer and the virtual fish tank can be comforted by the fact that it's still there and you can still go see it. But all of the computer history related artifacts moved out here. And those artifacts are not just the big iron that you think about when you think about old computers, but it's also little iron, silicon. It's also software. It's also paper. We have tons and tons of manuals and documents and design drawings and schematics. We have thousands of photographs, videos, films, uh, coffee cups, t-shirts, uh, hats, basically everything you need to tell the history of an intellectual revolution, which is what we're trying to preserve here. The amazing thing to me still is that there is nobody else that do, is doing it. We're the only large-scale collecting museum in the world focused on computer history. And now, as John says, we have a spectacular new building just down the street uh, that we're going to turn into the permanent museum. And that museum will have three components. One is the collection, which is now much expanded and is still the best in the world. The second are public programs, like this lecture series, but like a series of exhibits that we are intending to do. The virtual, the, the, uh, the virtual storage exhibit that was in the old building, visual storage exhibit, is now disassembled and is being moved into the new building and will be open in the middle of June. So I hope you will all come back and see it. It's going to be one step further toward a public museum exhibit. It's not going to be a professionally curated exhibit, but at least things will be in chronological order. They'll have labels. And there'll be twice as much stuff as was in the old Moffett Field Warehouse, for those of you who visited there. What we're doing, I think, is supremely important. Computers are changing the world for all of us forevermore. And we happen to be privileged to be living through the time when that's happening. If you think this is an important thing to do, and here comes the commercial. I always sound like a KQED pitchman when I do this. If you think this is an important thing to do, we need your help. If you think we should collect these things, display these things, do oral histories of the aging pioneers, then we need your help to do it. Come to the lectures. <laughs> we need your help to do the interviews. C come, to, come to the lectures. Um, look in your attics for what things you have that might go in the collection. Uh, become a volunteer. And of course, give your financial support. At the very least, everybody in here should become a member of the museum. It doesn't cost that much. I think it's $60. But that goes to the annual campaign to pay the operating expenses of the museum. Give more generously if you can. We also have a capital campaign going to pay for that wonderful new building and for the exhibits that we're going to be putting into, in it. So please, if you think this is important, help us out. But now on to the fun part of the evening. Um, as you all know, VisiCalc also changed the world. Uh, before VisiCalc, people would buy a computer by saying, well, I want a 4 megahertz Z80 with 64K of memory. And after VisiCalc, people would walk into the computer store and say, I want to run VisiCalc. Tell me what I need to do that. It really changed the way people viewed personal computers. And there are lots of questions to ask, like why hadn't it been done before? Um, the person here who's going to be asking those questions and many other questions is well known to you, Charles Simone. Back in the 1970s, if you wanted to work at the cutting edge place for user interface and for user friendly applications, there really was only one place, and that was Xerox, Xerox Palo Alto Research Center. And Charles worked there for almost a decade. And then he went from the most important think tank for software to the most important independent software developer, which is Microsoft, and has worked had worked at Microsoft for uh, almost a decade. Now, even before those two things, he knew a little bit about computer science, because he did get a degree from the University of California at Berkeley and a PhD in computer science from, from Stanford. So he's clearly a well-renowned scientist. But he's also, and you may not know this, an important philanthropist. He has endowed at least two chairs at, at distinguished universities. And they're not what you might think. They're not computer science. He has endowed a chair at Oxford for the public understanding of science and a chair at the Institute for Advanced Studies, on which he uh, sits at the board, um, in theoretical physics. That gives you an idea of the wide-ranging interests of this remarkable person. So please join me in welcoming a scientist and a philanthropist, Charles Simone. Good evening. Um, and thank you, Len, for the very generous remarks. And I would like to extend all of you a very warm welcome. 
Tonight's program, organized by the Computer Museum History Center, is going to be very interesting, the origin and impact of VisiCalc. Participating in the program and being in the focus of the program will be, of course, the creators of VisiCalc, Bob Frankston and Dan Bricklin. Frankston and Bricklin, they are the personal computer industries, Watson and Crick. It is said, <laughs> it's Bricklin, Frankston, What's the name? <laughs> it is said that success has many fathers. In the beginning of many important discoveries and developments are frequently shrouded in uncertainty and controversy. But this is the exception that challenges the rule. And uh, because the origins of the spreadsheet are quite compact and unambiguous, as we shall see tonight. We are also very honored to have with us on the panel Mitch Kapoor who greatly amplified the impact of VisiCalc by creating Lotus 123. His program was the afterburner to the VisiCalc jet engine. <laughs> so I would like to start by uh, thanking <laughs> and recognizing I'll have to remember that one, right? <laughs> the people who helped organize this evening. Pam Cleveland, the events manager, and Karen Matthews, Executive Vice President for the Computer Museum, as well as John Tool, Executive Director. Thank you. We also want to thank <laughs> Microsoft Corporation for their hospitality and for this great venue. And I see that there are many friends here in the audience, and we are all very glad that you are here. Thank you. So one important purpose of this panel is to create a very personal record of the historical and technical details of the physical story. One reason that Dan asked me to moderate the panel is because I'm a technical person, maybe very narrowly so, and because I also participated in the industry in about the same time frame in the early 80s as an admiring competitor. And I later, I even worked side by side with Bob at Microsoft in the 90s. We will hear a lot about Bob's and Dan's backgrounds, so I do not have to go into that. But I should mention some of the numerous awards that they have received. Dan was given, among many others, the IEEE Computer Society's Computer Entrepreneur Award and the Lifetime Achievement um, Award from the Software Publishers Association. He also received an honorary doctorate from Newbury College. <laughs> Bob got PC Magazine's Lifetime Achievement Award as and, well and as Together. Oh, together. together? Yes. Excellent. We each, we each have half a oh, Wait a minute. It was, that was supposed to be a balance here. So <laughs> so this is symmetry breaking. It's called. <laughs> and the, 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 he is also an ACM fellow. Together, they were honored by the Western Society of Engineers Washington Award. And I want to read to you, as I change the citation, from the award letter where they were recognized for the invention of the first computer spreadsheet software program, which led to the proliferation of the computer industry, which in turn led to the economic expansion of the late 20th century. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> which then, which what? then crashed in the air. <laughs> what, but what a great way to summarize the impact of physical. <laughs> so let's start the program. I will propose topics and we will see how things will go. Uh, we will reserve about 30 minutes at the end for a question period, so please hang on to your questions until then. But Quest if, yeah. I was going to say, if you have corrections, though, <laughs> <laughs> since a lot of people in the audience were, were also involved in those days. <laughs> Always follow the, um, the, the the advice of the guests. <laughs> <laughs> so, question number one. What, in school or with your hobbies, prepared you to computers, to software, to applications? Let's see, in, in, in school, well, one of the things was uh, I learned Talmud and, uh, and Torah and stuff. When, you learn, when you're learning commentary, you learn about really looking deep inside side of stuff, and that, that type of stuff I think was helpful. Um, and not from school, I learned from my dad to prototype. That was, uh, he was a printer, 
And as a printer, he learned he had to mock up things. And I learned about, because if you didn't, you, the, you would print it wrong and they wouldn't pay for it. So you would, you would mock it up and you know, tape things together and say, is this what you want? Because I'm going to build it like this. Uh, so that was, um, that I, I think was a real help. Um, real school was, was at Harvard Business School, obviously, because there I learned uh, what business needed together with what I learned at MIT, and you put the two of them together. Don, I well, know well, this. Do you have to talk to Oh, okay, me? I'm sorry. But I'll give it, I can give the story <laughs> later about, that's what I learned in school. I can give more specific about what happened at Harvard, but we can do that later. Excellent. Yeah. Bob? Um, it, you know, it, it's interesting. Basically, computers, I accidentally, so I guess the timing is right. It, they became available at the time when the other choices would have been like ham radio, electric trains, building things. This was much easier. So I never did get my code spe speed up. And um, my interest in actually things like psychology were actually parallel. So when I went to college, I originally was going to be in physics, but it wasn't obvious that it was really there was computer stuff. It was a college thing. It was too easy. Uh, later, luckily, I found out there were a lot of things to learn, but it was not so much a program. Again, it was all the you know, co uh, philosophical things, ambiguity, psycholinguistics, accounting, as a philosophical concept was very important. But the main thing is I accidentally you know, got jobs doing programming online systems back in 66. So I've always had a chance. I was building things for people to use. So there are all these things going on at once. So it's hard to you know, point to any of them as much as a chance. Basically, it was applied ADHD. It's the simplest answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. actually, thanks to going to MIT together, we met each other. So yeah. that was yeah. real important. And, and there was this other group, friend of ours, David Reed, who many people are aware of, also, but he stayed on to work in this thing called the Internet. I don't know whether it happened with that. And then we got him to join us. What was your first computer? Can you remember its memory size? And in the spirit of Marcel Proust, can you remember how it smelled? Yes. <laughs> yes, no, yes. Um, <laughs> the first one that I actually got to, t uh, to use uh, and program was uh, Quicktran on a uh, IBM 7044. Um, a fine machine. Fine machine, but it was, <laughs> oh, got to do it. Uh, it was at a local high school, and I would go visit there and go in and be able to use it because it was a, a public school and everybody was able to use it. And uh, the smell of the, the that terminal with the, the ball on it, it was the, the fifth, what was it? Not the 2741, the one before. Oh, yeah, the 1050. 1050. And so that had a distinct, but you can't describe the smell. Uh, the um, ink and the grease. Yes. <laughs> of what it was. That was the first, and of course the first line I typed in is I spelled dimension wrong. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> it was. I don't think that was Microsoft Basic. We are talking about the, the, it was, the it was Well, Quicktran, yeah, so it was a version of Fortran. Um, yeah. I, I, my was the IBM 1620. Hunter College got an IBM 1620 machine many people here are very familiar with. Uh, and I went instead of my mother to the faculty cl class. I was in junior high school. So I stayed long enough to you know, they let me run one program, a leap year program. But, but I learned, you know, a lot more than just that. It was 20,000 20, uh, digits. Couldn't do arithmetic, as people here know. You had to load up tables. Uh, the other machine, though, I worked on at the time, but I tried to build my own. You too. And I, what I, I basically was going to do a half ad or add things, but I didn't get a chance to correct one mistake I made. I made my own relays and everything. It's just AC doesn't work for relays. <laughs> but, it would, but it created some fine buzzes. <laughs> it's software, not hardware. Yeah. I have only one word for you. Rectifier. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I was building some flip flops, but of course I was using, I didn't have a debounced button, so I, you know, it always seemed to not work right. Yeah, but at but least I you found out later. Fancy. Then you, you, you didn't say how much memory you had approximately. You said no to the answer. Whether I have no idea how much was on. Approximately, come on. How much on QuickTran on a 7044? A 7044 would have had 32,000 bytes. Back in 1960. No, 32,000 bytes. 1965. Okay. Right. That, 60, that, 66. That, that, that what? sounds great. No, 30,000 words, not bytes. Words, They're words. And six, six, anybody want to know about that, the store parity that, That's fine. <laughs> Let's close it up. We are. The next question is, what was your first personal computer? And this is a trick question. Yes. Bob? Okay, I mean, uh, the, the, you know, obviously, I, I think, well, the SDS 940, actually the SDS 920, but then the SDS 940 would be the ones used hands-on, and that was rapidly replaced by uh, the Multics machine and the IBM 360-67. Well, fine PCs. 
Yeah. Not very powerful yeah, by Would tradition. you want to elaborate in what sense were they personal? Well, you know, you just go do whatever you want, whenever you want, you ran the system. Exactly. You know, you crashed it, so what? Uh, you, you know, you try to do it at night when nobody else is playing with it. Uh, and you walked up the console. I mean, okay, there were large time sharing systems by those standards. But for those of us, you know, had a chance, you know, to actually be on the development side, those who really were personal computers. As a matter of fact, my master's thesis was on charging for service on them, but the doctor I wanted to write back uh, then, 73, 74, assumed we'd each have our own personal computer. We wouldn't trust the other computers. And we'd be on a network, we'd have to cache information because obviously you can trust information from other people in the network and they weren't reliable. Um, and, you know, and the assumption, again, was they were personal. Uh, the real thing, I think that the reason why the 60, I'm going to count the 6020 as a person in the same sense, was 6020 is concerned just about the details of programming it. And in a sense, uh, in, you know, and, you ha and break, I guess the main thing is I'm breaking it. One of the nice things about these systems was I didn't worry about breaking for two reasons. One, the time sharing systems were relatively robust. And when I was hacking at the systems level, it was okay if I crashed because that was my job. So you really had a chance to sort of play with machines without looking at the clock, without having to, to you know, justify why did I break something, or if I broke, you know, or I really was too stupid to care. So, uh, so, so you, yeah. uh, using that one, well, quick, quick tran. I mean, uh, that's like personal, but that was sharing with a few sharing, other people. Yeah. The first one I got hands on alone at times was a, um, um, an 11:30. Uh, at a National Science Foundation summer course, the summer of 1967, at the Moore School of the University of Pennsylvania, which was down the hall from where ENIAC was built. Um, later that winter, I went uh, the the um, public uh, the Bureau of Public Education in Philadelphia. I was able to borrow their computers. They would stop doing payroll, and I could run Fortran on this multi-pass, you know, where the tape drives would run one pass and another. So I could run my stuff, use those, and then off to Multics, PDP 8 stuff like that. Well, I just want to add that that I shared your experience in in the 60s when we were systems programmers. Uh, the machines were very accessible in a very deep sense, and and uh, we could interact with it. We could crash it. We had all the privileges. Uh, just like on a personal computer, and there were more similarities, which brings us to the next question. Well, actually, which, one which other Mitch, personal computer. Also, what was well, I just want to mention one other personal computer was a PDP six. Was what it ran Star Wars on? <laughs> was Space War, I guess. Well, yes, that's, well, that's personal. Yes, that was. Yeah. You know, I have my questions coming up a little later. This is the, uh, I know, but I'm yeah, yeah, I'm okay, no. Now. I mean, okay. you want me to answer uh, a little, but uh, let me. I'll get my turn later. Okay. <laughs> um, any case. So here comes the next question, which connects to this one, which was, which one was first real? That is to say, post-1975, say, personal computer. What was its memory size? And was there a deja vu all over again, at least with respect to memory size and performance? Well, well, well Dan's thinking about it. I mean, no. there are a whole set of different machines. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got, you know, uh, well, this is what, by the way, East Coast, a, a millisecond pause, right. you lose the conversation. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I was told that that's true, so I, I, I take it on face value. Yes. So, uh, it's the, yours now. You know, it. There was a very small computer, like the IBM 407, I was actually proud to program. And how many people programmed an IBM 407? Okay. Good crap. Uh, it, it basically had about three words of memory, and you programmed the plug board, and it couldn't resist the 1970 programming for a production application. And it also, there are all these process control computers like the HP 2115, where you do it. But the first one that was meant to be a personal computer I used was a company called ECD. They made capacitors, and we decided they were going to do PCs, not like these flaky companies out on the West Coast. Uh, and they designed a 6502 based machine that had 16K for starters, but, ha but the maximum capacity was 64 megabytes. Uh, you could put a pile of processors, maybe 16. Segmentation uh, and. Well, yeah. It, yeah, it had memory mapping. You could pile processors on, additional multiprocessors, overlapped IO. How much and did it cost? Well, the price is $1,500. No, it was 987.5. Oh, oh, that was the original right. It was 97.54. They, they that, no, now, normally price is much more than cost, and that's the thing you learn in business. They didn't quite figure that out. <laughs> they went out of business. But, but it matters to the story. 
because well, well that's where I got and luckily they had a 6502 processor so I got very fast on it, it and we and the tools developed by one of the programs I write this on the site so I don't want to belabor it John Doty who had a, a fine assembler for the 6502 that ran on Multics and allowed for structured assembly language without go tos that will come back in the story That'll come later. back later then uh, first real personal computer that I got, uh, well first I saw, I went down to the lo local Radio Shack and saw uh, TRS-80 when it came out. Um, and then I guess the first time I really played with an Apple II is when uh, Dan Feilster gave me, let me play with his over a weekend and I actually did the, the VisiCal prototype. Um, I didn't actually buy one of my own until years later, we always just borrowed. And, um, <laughs> it's a common story. So anyway, we have the stage now is set. We have the personal computer, and we have relevant experience, maybe a, a decade old. So the next important question that we should really focus on is what were the circumstances of how you came up with the spreadsheet idea? And when did the idea become a business? Mitch has a very important, a very interesting story that sets that scene. Mitch? About the spot of the invention? Absolutely. Okay. So um, for many years through the late 80s and 90s, uh, at Harvard Business School in the entrepreneurship uh, curriculum, there was a case taught which was about the founding of Lotus. And so it was the occasion for my annual trip over uh, to the B School to be part of the case. When you couldn't make it, Esther went. When Esther couldn't, I went. That's right. Um, <laughs> And one time, uh, I noticed that the students were sort of dozing off during the case, especially <laughs> the ones up in the sky deck, up in the upper boxes, which I found right. offensive. And I thought for a minute, and I said, you know something? If I remember correctly, in this very room, Aldrich 108 at the business school, Dan Bricklin came up with the idea for the spreadsheet. Surely you can do something better than doze off. <laughs> oh. Oh. And it occurred to me that as an inspiration to students, there ought to be a plaque in the room for them to look at that said, on such and such a day in such and such a year, Dan Bricklin invented the first you know, electronic spreadsheet. That is. In fact, there's Aldrich 108. That's what it looks like today, Aldrich 108. Do you have a shot of the... Uh... <laughs> now, by the way, you can tell this is a late thing because it's the design, later design of VisiCalc. We'll explain yeah. what that is. <laughs> you can see, see that illustration again. Yeah. So, by the way, get credit, Bill Solomon, who is yes. a professor of uh, finance there, was the person who took the idea about the plaque, which I've been trying to sell unsuccessfully for probably 10 years, this is dated 1999, he gets the credit for actually picking up on the idea and, and implementing it. Yeah. By the way, I do have to defend sleeping in class. I spent half my career in college asleep in class. And it wasn't until, uh, until Suhas Patil's class, if anybody knows Suhas, that he realized he's better sleep in the back row, not the front row. Uh, uh, Dan, before you yeah. say your piece, I just want to mention that in the University of Chicago, there is a similar plaque of where the first chain reaction right. ever took place. And I think that I've you it, yes. truly started a financial <laughs> chain reaction here. So tell us about, about how it happened. Um, well, we know see. that it's true now. Yes. We here, let's go back. Uh, I'll do a few pictures here real quick. Uh, this is where Bob and I met. This is MIT, where Bob and I went together. At, uh, that's. Uh, that's uh, Project Mac. It doesn't look like this anymore. There. It doesn't look like that anymore, but it does. It did back then. We were on the fifth floor. AI Lab was on the top. I went to DEC, did word processing, went to Harvard, and that's what I look like at Harvard. Okay. No, that, wait, that's now, that, that doesn't show the other, no, it's with the hair. They'd show the other side. If I turn around, my ponytail was down to here. <laughs> that was for the first year of the business school. And um, what, what happened there, well, I mean, the story, which I tell is true that I, I would, having worked on word processing at DEC, having worked on APL, 
helping Bob mm -hmm. with uh, uh, a little bit with the basic he had done. Uh, and at, implementing my, my uh, implementing a version of basic at uh, my bachelor's thesis at um, at uh, MIT. I was into interpreters and into um, into things to do with um, screen-based things. I also worked on computerized typesetting when I was a digital. I'll get a little bit into that in a second. And so. The, as I sat there daydreaming, we all daydream, except I daydreamed on the first row. The reason is at Harvard, when you're in the first row, you're down below the professor. The professor looks up to the sky deck and stuff like that. Uh, that's why you can catch them asleep. Uh, you, can become, you can become president from the sky, sky deck, so it's, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, well, well that, that's an, these, an open question. No, some, some, of our, some of our most successful, in many ways, uh, uh, students uh, went off you know, were from the sky deck. But those of us down at the front, um, so there I, stay, I would sit back there. I like history, which is why that was Dave Reed's calculator. We were doing a case about, uh, about calculators. I daydreamed about a magic type of a blackboard that would do what I couldn't do, which is when I made a mistake, I always made mistakes in my homework, erase one number and have it change them all. And we saw, uh, back to the, the picture that Mitch uh, as you saw, we, we had all these blackboards. So I, we, people would say, well, who did it for 5%? Who did it for 10%? And Louis always had the answer. He had done it for all of them. I learned later Louis was winging it, but that <laughs> when I told him the story. But um, I imagined my calculator being a mouse, having a mouse in the bottom. I had seen an alto over at MIT, and, um, and there was enough keys on it to do sort of key stuff, and I imagined I had a head-up display. Literally, I was imagining this, and that you would put you would sort of type numbers in with the keyboard on top of the mouse, so you could use one hand, and be able to put in some numbers and another number and circle it, and then put a sum, push because the, there's a sum button on the, uh, let's see, where's my calculator? I'll show my calculator. Um, eh, I don't have a picture of my calculator here. Whatever, I have it out uh, here, so yes, I do, I'm sorry. On my website, <laughs> you can go to my website and you can see pictures of stuff like this. This is my calculator, okay? And he, uh, he dressed up as one at Halloween party. I, yes, we have a picture of me dressed up as this cat. Little did I know I'd be dressed up as this at one of Bob's um, Halloween parties. Um, and so I imagined this, this, um, uh, this head-up display and having that type of stuff. And then I started thinking about this idea about having this electronic spreadsheet. Um, the summer, oh, the summer of 78, while riding my bicycle at, um, on Martha's Vineyard, I decided that what I was going to do is I was going to develop this product, come up with this idea of this electronic merging of word processing and calculating or something, and build a product um, and, and do that. Now, I had this idea in the spring, uh, which is about 25 years ago today, for all we know. and. Um, went to my professors to give them, to tell them this idea. The first professor I went to, uh, I wanted to go to my finance professor, obviously, but he wasn't available. So the first professor I went to was my production management professor. And uh, he, I said, you know, we'll have this thing. You'll be able to do calculations on the screen. And you could use a modem so people can communicate with it. And he said, wow, Dan, you know, people fly in together to be in the room to do production management calculations, uh, MRP or whatever, and they would have blackboards that go from one room to another that they would do. This idea of, well, I don't understand what you're doing, but it sounds really cool. That's cool. You know? Then my next professor I got to see was my, uh, fine, was my um, professor for cost accounting, Professor Jim Cash. <laughs> now, now, Cash is a great, Cash, what a great name for a finance professor. Um, Jim actually had been a programmer. He actually knew programming, and I went to visit uh, mainly main, mainframe programming and stuff, and I went to Jim and explained him what I'm doing. He said, Dan, I don't fully understand what you're talking about, but I do understand it's about the user interface, and the user interface is key. I think this is a really great idea. Jim became the first tenured black professor at Harvard. He's on the board of General Electric and Microsoft. He's head of the compliance committee, um, and so all sorts of wonderful things. Then came finally my finance professor. I told him, I said, um, professor, name won't be mentioned, and I said, you know, I got this great idea. We'll use it for, for real estate calculations and stuff like that. And he looked up from his Fortran listings and said, Dan, I'll tell you, you know, we already have financial forecasting systems. Why would anybody want yours? 
Um, however, I have this second year student, you're a first year student, I have a second year student who's been doing research about personal computers. He'll tell you why real estate agents won't use your product. His name is Dan Feilstra. And he has started a company called Personal Software. Let me give you his number. And that's how I met Dan Feilstra. That professor did not get tenure. Uh, uh, and, and Peter Jennings, of yes, course. Yes, and time. Peter can tell you some more. There are some people here, there are several people here uh, from uh, Personal Software Visicorp. Um, and um, uh, that professor now when people ask him for ideas, he says, you're asking me whether it's a good idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but then my, uh, one of my other professors, who I showed it to later, uh, uh, Professor Glauber, went off to become Assistant Secretary of the Treasury. He also didn't think it was so great. So he said, and he's head of NASDAQ or something. He says, mm, you know, who knows? So, so, so that professor wasn't so bad. That's how I met Dan. I called Dan up and said, hey, I've, uh, you know, what, what you doing? And he said, I got this thing called Microchess, done by this guy, Peter Jennings, who's sitting right here. It's really cool. I use mm -hmm. Apple computer to do stuff. And that's where I decided to go and do, the, uh, to do this project. Um, the, to actually come up with the specifics of the idea, though, um, I, I, needed to, I was into prototyping. So first of all, how to figure out what it should be like. Well, I started prototyping it using, uh, using BASIC. And the actual, well, what I realized was that you had to build something special. I was, I knew how to program in BASIC. And whenever I was at Harvard, this friend of mine um, always beat me out with his calculator. He had a, uh, he had an HP calculator, not a TI, cheapy. And he had a programmable well, RPN one. RPN is so much better. What? RPN, RPN is so, so much better. And we'll get into RP, RPN. <laughs> half of us were RPN, half of us were, uh, we're algebraic, so with VisiCalc, I figured let's just go with no precedent. You'll just yeah, do it right away, just like a both. calculator. So therefore, because half the people knew one, half the people didn't the other. So um, what I did was I, I realized that he always beat me to it. I would run downstairs, program something in BASIC, and he would have it for our study group done sooner. So I realized that something's wrong with this programming thing. So, you know, there must be a better way, and there came, came VisiCalc. So I started trying to prototype it. I was trying to prototype it on, um, on their machine there. They had a VT05 probably connected to a, a DEC-10. And this idea of stuff all over the place, I did realize that you had to be able to name them. If you're going to be able to say this plus this, you've got to have a name. So I figured, how will you name it? Well, maybe you'll name it by having the, the first one is number one, the second one you did is number two. Well, how are you going to remember that? Hmm. Okay. Um, and then there were these, th I imagine, three planes of information. There's one plane, which is what you're seeing the display. There's another plane, which was the calculations. And another one, which was the formatting. Okay? Now, it turns out that I had seen a particular product that nobody ever talks about. We could <coughs> go over this. Can you have the Elmo, please? No, we were told just to ask for it. Oh, ask for the ammo. Oh, we voice response system. The there, no. Nope. Yep, got it. Okay, so oh, this move? is a Harris 2200. Okay, it looks like this. But let's look at the screens. Anybody seen a Harris 2200? One, two. They don't have one at the museum yet. This is what the screen looked like. And I'm going to zoom in to show you something. I had seen one of these because I was in computerized typesetting. And focus, here we go. This was a typesetting terminal. It was from 1973, is when they first came out with it. It was basically PageMaker, um, it was PageMaker done as hardware. <laughs> and it was, any, you know, this, each of these was a different slug of type, basically. It was a WYSIWYG. And you can move the cursor for each device. And what it had over here was a status line, one for each one. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait, let me have you. Oh, no, just, just, just talk, talk to me. Just talk to me. Oh, yes. Okay. So. <laughs> well, no, it's, this works now. Okay, I'm sorry. So this is the Harris 2200. So if we hit the autofocus. What you see here is um, it has quad center or, qu or ra ragged right. It basically had the formatting. It had the, um, you know, what size, what size width the thing was, what font it was, font bold, font medium. Um, 
and then what, you know, what the measure was and stuff like that. So basically this idea of having each item, we have an item and we have uh, status about it, that, I remember that. And that type of, I had that kind of that idea. Back to the computer, I guess. Whatever. So I, sitting down at, at the Harvard thing, I came up with the a, computer, well, please. What? yes. So I thought about, well, how am I going to name it? Let's name it by columns and rows. That'll make it easy. We'll name them by, and we'll, we'll have A, B, C, 1, 2, 3, or something like that. So now, because then you can parse it, because um, if it was, you know, like, I want to keep, oh, I can pay, came from computerized typesetting. Computerized typesetting, you were paid by the keystroke. So I was into keystroke minimization. I was from, real important, everyone, people were paid by the keystroke. Also, um, in, I was in word processing, where every keystroke counted, because people, that's all they did all day was to type. So I was looking for minimizing keystrokes in terms of stuff, and maps work with it. So I had that idea of columns and rows, and that's what I programmed on, on the Harvard machine. But the Harvard machine, you know, running in basic on a time sharing machine isn't the greatest. Then Dan Feilstra in the fall of, 19, uh, of 1978, he hired, he told me that he was interested, and he didn't know about this thing I was doing yet, after I decided I wanted to do it. Um, he, we were trying to figure out what machine we were going to use, I was going to use to do it. I thought maybe I'd use a deck machine. I was a Digital Equipment Corporation uh, alumni. I liked their stuff. I was a shareholder. They had this PDT-11, uh, which was a, um, a programmable data terminal. I had actually some earlier versions of that type of stuff I had actually programmed microcode for. 256 bytes was all that it had in the memory, you know, um, for the microcode. So I tried to get my hands on a PDT. I was going to program an OMSI Pascal. It was going to be in a higher level language and everything. But the deck, pr uh, the deck salesman didn't, didn't push on me, so I didn't do it. And I talked, uh, Dan Feilstra said he was interested in getting a copy of Bridge converted from the TRS-80 to the, uh, to the uh, 6502 for the Apple II in BASIC. I said, well, Bob knows 6502. Why not have him do it? So Bob came and did that and was working with him. And Bob was not, Bob's very resourceful. He needed a listing. They didn't have a printer on their TRS-80. He brought his SX-70 camera. Well, and, and he also had to be careful not to wake Peter Jennings up, who's sleeping in the other room. Yes, that <laughs> so was the that was the room where you would stay, and, <laughs> and so they would. So Bob took the picture of the list, listing and typed it and make the other. And I was telling Bob about my thing, and Do Bob mentioned to Dan about this idea that I have something or other to do with spread with some number thing. And Dan said, "Well, if you have, why not do it for the Apple II? You can borrow mine." So I borrowed it over a weekend. It was a holiday weekend at Harvard in the fall of '78, and I prototyped this VisiCalc thing. And it was going to have columns and rows. I programmed it in integer basic at first, I think, uh, or later in, uh, in floating point. I think it just kept it in integer. Yeah, and then it just kept it in integer. Yeah, because it's just testing it. And um, it, I, I wanted to have the mouse, but we don't have a mouse in an Apple II. So, but it had paddles, you know, the game paddles. So <laughs> you would turn the paddle this way, and the cursor would go this way. <laughs> and then you would push the fire button, and it would go up and down. <laughs> And it worked. Now, it didn't scroll because I didn't have that. Now, when you recalculate it, when you push the recalc button, I had it tell you it was recalculating by going click. But of course, that takes it went tick, tick, tick. You could watch it. They moved the cursor to it. It turned out that the sound, the tick sound, plus the moving the cursor and showing it, uh, recalc showing the recalculation was about 80% of the time. I sped <laughs> it up by getting rid of it and go faster. But the problem with the, 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 the mouse, with using the supposed mouse, the paddles is an RC circuit. And it wasn't, you know, it sort of drifted a little bit, and there was no actual pointer cursor that was moving through it. So you might be on an edge and it would sort of sit there going, like this. so this is no good. But the Apple II had two arrow keys. So I just quickly changed the code, and left and right arrow made it go left and right, and you hit the space bar instead of fire, and it made it go up and down. Um, and I made this, this prototype. And so now we had a prototype for it. Now at that point, Back to the Elmo. How long does it take to go back to the Elmo this time? Whoa! That was quick. Too quick. Yes. <laughs> this is from the, a, program, a book from Microsoft called Programmers at Work. Microphone. Oh, microphone, microphone. This is from a book at Microsoft called Programmers at Work. Um, volume, I don't, one, volume one. Volume one. Uh, somewhere <laughs> or other, there's the, I have to find the original somewhere at home. This is actually a piece of spreadsheet paper. You can see 
all it, it's one of those green, it was, black, white, it was light blue lines on white paper, big paper like that, and I scribbled on the back and I wrote a state diagram of what I thought the spreadsheet should look like. This is from around November, and it has stuff like, um, let's see, replicate, we called it, I already called it replicate. Um, and at this point, uh, if you put a number in, you would get an expression and um, there was a, there was L for label, U, if you typed a U, you could point, it means I was using, I was gonna use a number. Well, later on, I had a friend of mine, John Reese, who said, why do you need to type the U? So you're right. If it's one plus arrow, it's, you know, obviously the thing to do is it means you're pointing. So I got rid of that. But it's nice when people ask you stuff like that. Uh, replicate over here, you know, from where to where, and it, this is an early version of what I was gonna do for, um, is it absolute? or not, but I didn't know exactly how to do it according to these calculations. It got better later. Uh, incremental value and stuff, things that later on came in. We had all these great ideas we were going to do. Bob's written up a lot of the actual programming on his website that came out a couple of days ago. Um, yesterday to be exact. Yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> great. Well, I've been meaning to write up those notes for 20 years and I sort of <laughs> finally got motivated. Um, well, no, it, it's uh, interesting. Bob, 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 it's, oh. it's your turn now. If you can tell us about what tools you used for okay. development yeah. and what were the basic data structures. Well, I, uh, I think I'll start out with experience, you know, point out some things from Dan's talk. Uh, you notice that the assumption was we'd be sitting up using heads up graphic interactive displays, you know, in, in shared rooms, uh, and that we would have pointing devices and things. And the real breakthrough that Dan does emphasize is uh, the simplification to the grid that, g that you know, basically gave people a way to refer to things without having to describe them and really gave you, you know, it basically gave you the, the framework that removed the need to, to base, to, you know, re greatly reduce the complexity and, may, and it's what made things disappear. And that, you know, two points. One is people don't realize, you know, we, we knew this stuff back then. And the importance of basically what you don't do. Um, and I think even for me, it was when Dan did that prototype that I realized, okay, now I see it. Now, now you know, now it, right, it was yeah, and more I or less. Yeah, and I think that one of the, you know, I, I mean, I'm looking at Dan's state talk, and a lot of that, you know, uh, well, and I wanted to program it, but oh yeah, oh, but oh the, uh, I was in school. Right. The problem is that Dan didn't find to program it, and I figured, what the hell? Uh, you, how many weeks uh, it did looked, it take it, you? Uh, yeah, well, I didn't know how long, but I figured, well, it looks interesting. If I let's say I was getting five dollars an hour, then may, maybe I'll come ahead, maybe I won't. But you know, uh, it was I, I couldn't resist doing it, uh, and so I would work at night in my attic, and I, I had this nice apartment which actually had a huge attic. Okay. Uh, it was large enough that sure I was pictures. able to keep my magazines and stuff. And as an aside, pictures again. Those magazines became the Sword for Us Library, which became the Lotus Library, and the librarian eventually wanted to be the Microsoft Librarian. Here's the attic. Oh yes, uh, on Broadway, uh, uh, Paul Revere's route through Bob, Arlington. Bob used SX70 and took pictures of all sorts of stuff. This is one of Bob's SX70 pictures of the attic, which you can describe. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. Well, I mean, that's an Apple II for, for, uh, and a screen. Uh, yeah, that was one of the tables I worked on. The other uh, end of it was my uh, deck LH 120 for my day job, which I never went to. Uh, <laughs> well, it was nice working. In th by the way, that was the legacy of working interactive data on the SDS 940 by the Lampson back at the beginning. Okay, so um, you know, and then you know, we'd meet in the evening when Dan, when I was waking up, and Dan was you know coming from school to go over things. And, uh, okay, I'll, I'll explain that in detail. So, uh, basically, well, no pun intended, uh, because I'd written the basic for ECD. Uh, and the assembler uh, we used ran on Multics. Now, Multics itself is a whole other interesting history, which I won't go into, uh, except that because of ECD, you had the 65 tooth we could download, and the reason I worked at night was only a dollar an hour for time, and the only competition I have was this other minor little project called Ada. <laughs> uh, that was being done for France, third shift time. Was they knew about this was cheap and cheaper, and it was worth making a transatlantic phone call for France to use a computer at MIT. 
So uh, no, it also took them two or three months for the bills to come through. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, I, well yeah, the, but, that, you know, it, it, again, things got became more expensive later. <laughs> uh, so, you know, uh, ba so it was ba basically, and even that winter, there was this little snowstorm. They shut the city down for a week, banned cross country to on the main streets. But, oh, no, that was the year before was, uh, when I was still at ECD, which is why it worked from, from a idea. distance, oh, you know, works well. Oh, uh, yeah. In any case, uh, so... Uh, no. So you would wake up at, you'd wake up like three in the afternoon. I would come home from, I would come back from school, which ended around three in the afternoon, and I would go over to Bob's, and he'd be waking up, he'd be there in his night robe, his bathrobe and stuff, and we'd see what he did last, the night before, right? It was. Yeah. And, you know, it, it was, uh, in any case, the code, just to point out, th this code was, uh, I, I didn't get a chance to find the, some earlier listings. I'm going to try to locate, I'm going to try to locate them. But uh, oh, show the oh yeah, I'm not okay. Yeah, so, but uh, but this is basically essentially the the code from the original version since it didn't have to change. Uh, now, how many 6502 programmers are there here? Okay, glad to know some of you still remember the code. Okay, well, okay, I don't think I'm gonna have to point to the code necessarily, but the machine itself had um, the if I remember wrong, I'm trying to remember even now, it had the uh, A register, the X and the Y registers. So you would load the standard accumulator, uh, and you know you compare it to eight bit bytes, and it was a pretty simple machine. But of course, we want to work with you know I, again. I don't want to go through the code in detail, except to note that you notice that for those, there was there was a religion called Gotula's programming. Now I didn't view it religiously, but I did believe that Gotula just made the flow hard to follow. So if you notice this code, even though it's an assembler. It's basically standard looping instructions. And, and it's commented. Oh, oh, yeah, if you back off, you'll see the comment. The purpose of the comments was, I, one thing I'd learned in programming was, uh, if, you know, if, if somebody got, if I got hit by a truck, would I be able to, you know, the next person would be able to read the code? But more important, I realized that, you know, after you write a few lines of code, even you can't figure it out anymore. <laughs> So uh, basically, my goal in commenting was not to necessarily comment each line, but to try to explain what the surprises were. But the assumption were most of the stuff you could figure out and guess, but what, what mistakes would I make when I come back to this after forgetting? So I did basically try to you know, point out you know, things like this. You know, what are things you have to be aware of if you modify the code? And, uh, um, well, we don't have to look at it in too much detail. <laughs> um, and this is, well, no, wait a minute, Bob. This, well, is, this is not early VisiCalc. I see VC2. No, I no know, this is, this is, Sarah, no, this is 1983. The code yeah. basically was commented, but I basically kept evolving, you know, and well, adding to the code. So this would include the Apple III uh, version. But the code itself was, you know, pretty but, much, uh, you know, intact. But Bob, this is no assembler that I know. This oh, wasn't oh, because the other little detail. Well, uh, oh, okay, no, the other little detail I had to do. Okay, after we had the Multics one, we, we decided to buy a prime computer, but it's most like Multics. So on the side, because it's boring, uh, first we had to write the tool, so we wrote a, simple, a trivial screen editor. Then I had to write an assembler. Um, right. You know, but you, you build the tools you need to do, so you build the assembler, and later... Uh, I'll be, you know, uh, and we got more program stuff, so I was just quickly and everything. So I got a chance to enhance my editor, and eventually There's it became an Emacs, uh, which we then traded to Prime for disk drive. <laughs> uh, and we had a program set Steinberg, who we hired, who and this guy we'll go, might get ahead. Uh, Seth, one thing Seth did was do a list implementation, which which we incorporated into the the editor. Uh, which is why the annotations line up and everything. But Seth also, he's a very experienced programmer. He'd done uh, a time sharing system for the Interdata computer. Then he's at the Architecture Machine Group, became Media Lab. Introduced, I think he's going to introduce a great philosophical concept of the bad luck fault. The machine wouldn't always be able to recover from an interrupt, so sometimes it's got a bad luck fault. Uh, but he, when he did the, the conversion for the Z80, uh, he basically put aside his ego and did it line by line comparable with the A6502 version, so that we can maintain the two versions manually in sync. You can look at the comments in 6502 version, 
to understand what's happening in the Z80 version. There weren't comments in the Z80. He literally, he ran a listing program that synced the two of them together on the labels and used the comments from one basically explain the other. And that was a sort of an open source. bugs were similar, turned yeah. out. It was open source that just goes back to, you know, to Multics when you, know, you contribute to the project. And I think there's a general sense, I keep emphasizing, VisiCalc was not a program, it was a product. And it was always fast enough with the programming, even back in the Multics days, that you know, you, you know, sometimes you made the mistake, you, got, you know, did something too clever, but one lesson I learned, you always paid the price for cleverness. Uh, right. So you had to keep it simple and not lose, remember the goal was to make the program, you know, make it the experience, you know, what you're trying to do with the program, which was paramount. Can you remind us how many people worked on the first version? Okay, VisiCat, I was programmed exclusively until we formed the company in uh, January 2nd, 1979. I came up with the name Software Arts, and we were a place we, I called uh, um, Kentucky Fried Fish. It was an old K KFC that had been converted, whatever. Fish place. fish place. And then, you know, we, uh, it was basically Dan and I working on it, came up with the name, like 3 in the morning, VisiCat things. Then we, we got office space, and I hired uh, Steve Lawrence to help us programming, who from ECD, and then this guy Brad Templeton, this kid over there, uh, came uh, uh, over to advise and had to deal with the pet as we started to expand out, and then slowly by uh, see the people who actually worked on the code of the original. Bob wrote most of it. Seth fixed some of the bugs. We brought Seth in. We brought Seth in who fixed some of the bugs. Uh, not Seth, I mean uh, Steve Lawrence Steve, fixed right. most of, some of the bugs. And, and um, it was not the ports. I ended up fixing, finishing the uh, transcendentals, yeah, the code on the right. transcendentals, and the copy protection came from personal software. I don't well, know the, but who no, did, did that. Did they do the first? I thought yeah, no. I think no, I th I th they, th they gave us the code for it, I think. Yeah. What, was the, uh, what was the total well, number of bytes in the executable? Was that well, I'm, not sure, I'm guessing 20,000, which is a failure. I mean, I yeah. wanted to fit the 60K Apple II. And you know, this is 20 kilobytes. Kilobytes, yeah. Yes. Just for comparison, uh, Excel XP, the newest <laughs> version is 8.7 megabytes. Yeah. Oh, that's no. just that's just that <laughs> part by no, itself. No, wait, no, 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 no. Bob, remember his 20, his it ran in 32. It included the OS. Oh, oh, wow. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and the and the screen buffer. I stand. I and stand the utilities for formatting disks I and stand what corrected. else? Yeah. Now, uh, gentlemen, we have to. Okay, uh, um, we'll go this, on to the this program. happy note. Yes. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. And, uh, we'll, we have to, to charge on because it's a it's a cliche that we can all remember where we were when certain momentous events took place. For example, the Apollo 11 moon landing in the computer industry. It's common to exchange stories about your first physical demo. For example, Stuart <laughs> Elsa wrote just one man, month ago in an unrelated column the following. I got an Apple II with the VisiCalc program in 1981. The Apple II with VisiCalc is what inspired me to join the computer industry and started me down the career path uh, that led to where I am today, whatever you think that's worse. <laughs> so Mitch. Oh, oh. Would you talk about Stuart? Yes. We, we, we gave Stuart the first demo. Well, you, you, you'll get your turn. Okay. Mitch, okay. Mitch gets the first one. <laughs> no, this is the most here. patient anybody has ever seen me. <laughs> <laughs> and we thank you. The, um, I had co-founded an Apple user group in the Boston area called the New England Apple Tree, which met monthly and people came and gave demos and, and, and we swapped programs, um, the, the Napster precedent. <laughs> and Bob came once, and I had met Bob, and Bob, and he was incredibly excited. And just no, before the meeting. A, my patient version. Yeah. <laughs> well, you've heard Bob talk. I didn't understand anything. <laughs> and you were into TM, you knew how. Yeah, no, I've been meditating a lot, and so I was kind of spacey still anyway. And we'll show you I, pictures of him. I knew Bob was incredibly excited, and I have to say, and it is one of the great embarrassments, he gave me this demo, and he started with a blank spreadsheet on the Apple II and built a few things and you know, put some formulas and copied them and changed the input and all the changes rippled through and I went, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, that was not the last demo I got, but <laughs> that was my, my first demo. You remember that, Bob? Oh, yeah, no, I, I remember giving the demo. I remember you uh, telling, <laughs> us about Mitch, telling me about Mitch. Yes, I'm, uh, you know, well, he was this tape librarian. There were right. tapes in those days, of course. Okay, Bob, your first demo? What? 
the first demo that you gave to where you, uh, you still remember no. where you were. Maybe where when I first gave, gave you a demo? Wait, you first gave me a demo? Yeah. Uh, it, well, we've been talking about it. I think that it was the, uh, I was doing the, the bridge conversion to the Apple II, I, uh, and I'd introduced, got the, Dan Foster interested in this. And before it actually, Dan had introduced me to, to, to Dan introduced me to Dan uh, Foster, and we were talking about like doing a basic thing. We actually spoke to this guy at TI, I remember, at Esper Little, about doing a basic for his machine. Uh, well, I mean, it, it, you know, all these people were <laughs> in those days. Um, and, you know, so, so I had a vague idea again, I was, you know, but it was when Dan, and it was, I probably Foster's office, but we didn't have many spare Apple IIs in those days. Had a return. Uh, you know, showed me, and then I realized, okay, it's a grid, and now I, I you know, oh, I see how to program that. Uh, that. Yeah. Your Stuart. demo to Stuart? I got to demo to Stuart. What happened is, Stuart Alsop was a writer for Inc. Magazine. He was the editor. He was editor time, yeah. And uh, exactly. Jeff Tarver was involved also, I think. They were, I don't know who was being, who was there and who was being let go or whatever at what time, but this, this is, um, <laughs> this is the <laughs> January 1982, birth of a new industry. This was the first article about our industry in a major publication. There was an article uh, with some pictures of a few of us in Fortune magazine before that. The, the thing about this, about this issue is this picture on page 64. Okay, this is page 64. <laughs> Who is it? Wait a minute, you have to, you have to, who, who is this guy? Okay, okay, what? Let's see, here we have Mitch. Okay, so that's, wasn't he cute? Yeah, I look at Bill. <laughs> Bill, I mean look, you know, there's Paul. There, you know, Paul and Tony Gold. Eventually, I sold my demo program to Lifeboat, which years later, there's Gary Kildo and all. This is an article by Steve Ditlia, who I happened to run into uh, about a week and a half ago. Um, and this doesn't. <laughs> no. <laughs> they, Thank you. That one was, I'll show you. <laughs> See? It's brown. <laughs> See? <laughs> wow. However, because Stuart put me oh. on the cover of Ink Magazine in a uh, plaid shirt, I could wear that for everything forever thereafter. <laughs> so this, Stuart, now while doing, now Stuart didn't write this article, Stuart wrote another article over here. And this was the first time Stuart had been involved. This is me and Bob. I'm, I was not wearing sunglasses. It was a long photo session with a photochromatic glasses. Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. It said, uh, Brickman Frankston cracked the mini microcomputer uh, micro software market wide open with a program called VisiCap by Stuart Alsop II. Okay. <laughs> this was the first connection with PCs for Stuart. And that's where we demoed for him the product. And of course, he cared about how do I start up some new publication or something. And that's the type of stuff that he did. Now, this, in this article, we get, they asked me this question which is, there are other questions about the future. Uh, similar programs. Eventually, Bricklin said, uh, VisiCalc will become a generic name or at least someone will come along with killer calc. The first word, killer, and yeah. notice they had a picture of Mitch in here. We probably won't have time to, you know, we won't have time to discuss the, uh, the origins of the killer app uh, phrase that was <laughs> actually first applied to Lotus 123 and then I understand retroactively was applied to, to, to VisiCalc. And, and then if, if I may add, I, I was having dinner in the Black Forest restaurant in Los Altos, summer of 1980, where I ran into Paul Hackle. And if you think that, that Microsoft people are arrogant, you should have seen the park people. They were much <laughs> more arrogant. And we thought that these were toys, these, these personal computers. But Paul Hackle said, you got to see this, you got to see this. So I saw it. And, and I, was, I was so impressed, because here was something that did a function that, that wasn't available on the Alto. So <laughs> it was inspired by so the I, Alto. I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that at the time. But the, I, I, it made me redouble my efforts to, to look for a job. And I met Bill uh, two months later. So thank you. Um, <laughs> yes. Now, and then, then you did a plan. Yes. So I, by I'm the just way, also, we, we did, we were, I don't know if we ever shipped, we did a version for the Xerox A20. 
Yeah, we did. Yeah. Is there right? a, yeah, it's amazing. I mean, it was a, there was, was a, a CPM a, machine. Yeah, CPM <laughs> machine. I mean, everybody had CPM machines. We could spend so much time on, 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 yeah. on the questions of, of uh, portability, on egoless programming. On the, uh, ideal well, actually, one comment time. about portability Wait. is w w there are two companies that looked at portability and we put resources and didn't pan out. Uh, software OS, we developed our own tools, languages, and this other company, Northwest, was also into portability. And so was context. So. Oh, well, no, but, but they, their code did it wrong. Yeah. I'm sorry, back no, code, code that was, was, was real time. Right? Con oh, yeah. Context no. MBA. No. That was so slow. <laughs> uh, anybody remember Context MBA? <laughs> it was the perfect foil. Yeah. So just with a few minutes left um, until the question period, oh. I want oh, to actually, ask everybody for something especially what, important that you might what, want to say. Well, one thing you didn't mention was Mitch's other role, product manager. Mitch? Mitch was product manager at Visicorp for quite a long time for, for, Visicorp, product? for the product and help us. He kept East Coast hours, even though he was on the West Coast. He also had his own product, by the he way. He was such a good product but He also, on the side, had his, his own products, Visipon and Visitrend, and I created a data interchange format so Visical could work with them. I remember when they hired you, the, the meeting. Well, the actual introduction, you guys made the introduction between personal software and me. Yeah. I remember when Dan was saying, Filestra was in town, he was saying, we were at dinner, the, you know, the, the three of us. He was saying, well, well, we need a product manager for this and this, and I, well, how are you going to find somebody? And you said, what about me? <laughs> <laughs> Next thing I know, he's in California. <laughs> As our product manager is great. So I, I, I do, I do want to say something, because VisiCalc literally changed my life. I had been into personal computers as a hobbyist, which quickly turned into um, a paying gig consulting at you know five and, and ten dollars an hour for people that needed little programs written in, in basic for an Apple II and amazingly in the Boston area there were just enough that you could survive on that and I was trying to figure out what to do with my life and um, VisiCalc, not the first time I saw it but probably the second or third was a, a complete uh, inspiration and I don't think people remember if they weren't there, what an impact um, it had. Because when I experienced it, I wasn't thinking about how it was done or the, the, the bits and the bytes. But there was a kind of an elegant minimalism to it. It did what it did incredibly well and got out of your way. It was a tool that you could use to be incredibly effective without knowing any programming whatsoever. I mean, that was an incredibly radical kind of breakthrough. It was, it was highly useful. You know, regular people could use it, and two things occurred to me. One was it was clear that everybody in the world was going to have a personal computer eventually, because if you could do this in the first couple of years that these things existed, imagine what you could do, you know, over a period uh, of, of time. And that also, my goal in life was to design something that could just stand next to VisiCalc without uh, embarrassment, just the, the sheer <laughs> The, the elegance of it, of do, and you know, that it did it in 20K is even, even more um, amazing. And the fact that it, I mean, I, I did not, had not heard before tonight uh, some of the details of the, the, the sources and the, uh, the influence. It was very interesting. But it is very unusual that something that important is sort of uh, born all of one piece by uh, a person, a couple of people at one time. Usually great things, the graphical user interface at Xerox Park with lots of people over lots of time going back to Stanford Research Institute. And the, you know, I think VisiCalc stands alone in terms of you know, it, it um, just being something that came out of nowhere. And, and very quickly after it arrived, it, it became recognized. Sorry. And 20 years later, Sorry. the spreadsheet, even though it takes up a 1,000 as many bytes on disk is still, it's recognizably the exact same creature. And so, I mean, I just think it is, it's an amazing and inspiring accomplishment. Well, some of that was because when you did one, two, three, you decided yeah. what essence to, it was right. like and compact and deciding and what I, the IBM PC was. I have to remember this afterburner yeah. thing because I, you were just you were unbelievably diplomatic in all directions at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's better than, yeah. It's, it's no, I mean, better than the early Excel commercials, if you remember what they said yeah. about but no, the thing is, when you, when you did 1, 2, 3, because I remember when I first saw 1, 2, 3, you know, and um, I, 
I turned, <laughs> turned I think it was to Tracy, we walked out, to, they're going to do 60 million the first year. I was off by 4 million or something. Yeah, you were very close. I was, I was really close. I would have won the bet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you thought it was be three or something. My initial uh, forecast. Never mission. good at forecasting. Yeah. <laughs> We, but, were, we um, were devastated but, when we saw yeah. one, two, three. We were completely devastated. Well, yeah. you know, he also showed me multiplan Fox, but yeah. Well, part of the reason I worked so hard on one, two, three, as I said, here was VisiCalc, and I wanted to do something that could stand in the same tradition. And I kept thinking, you know, I'm never going to think up something from scratch like that. But having been in the spreadsheet world a lot, wanting to do something that really took it to the next level. Of you know, it had an enormous potential. There's only so much that you could do on an Apple II, but if you took it to a 16-bit machine and didn't have any legacy issues, you could just use it however you wanted to. You know, you didn't have to use the, the single-letter interface. And VisiCalc was adequate, but it was cryptic, and it was a requirement of squeezing into the Apple II. But on the IBM, you could actually yeah. use words. It was right. supposed to have stuff no, like I, that. But, I, but, I, I, but the thing is, you did take. You took all the things that looked like ended up being the right things, as opposed to making it different for the sake yeah, of different, but, uh, actually, and then added all the stuff. Yeah. It was I, I think there are two uh, some important points to make here. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I mean about the, in a sense what gave Mitch in two directions for him. One, I'd wanted to add a database capability. The problem is I over-designed it. I was trying to make it a real great database, better than this bilge pump thing some people were doing. <laughs> uh, for, <laughs> uh, for those who remember the early DBase ads. Uh, you know, uh, because I'd had a heavy database background. I over-designed it. I was, uh, you know, to make it fit and everything, it was just too formidable, number one. The other thing is, because of our heritage, we were very, I was overly concerned about space and size. And again, uh, in programming, you know, basically, Mitch, I think, started the Apple and rapidly gave up on it. And he did something we didn't dare do, which is require 128K IBM PC. W w you know, it's sort of, the mach turns out the program was valuable enough that we had over hobbled ourselves in one direction. Right. Now, there's a whole other discussion we can have, we don't have time for. Is the whole VisiCorp relationship, which also well, that's a business. no, it's a business issue, made yeah, it difficult for us to evol evolve in certain ways. But it's also important, to, you know, sometimes a combination of rethinking. Mid the way Dan's constrained to the Apple II g gave us the grid and things. Uh, Mitch is trying to do just enough database to get away with, where I was trying to do a great database. Basically, ga gave him the chance to do a lean thing. And by restarting without you know, giving up on this very tight constraint, he was able to restart. I think you know, one of the general lessons is people think of optimization as hill climbing. And sometimes you, know, you need a perturbate thing, jump to another hill to move on. And that's why you, you do need sort of marketplace turmoil to some extent. Otherwise, you just get more and more you know, stuck at any point. Um, and the other, well, uh, there's another yeah, There were a lot of compromise what? things we did not do because we wanted it to be the right way. And you broke some of those that we were not willing to break, and they were right to break them. That was the, this thing you asked at the beginning. How do you decide how to simplify it down? Each, that's, those are some of the hardest decisions. Um, looking at some of the old, doc I have old documentation, and looking at the things that were thrown out and things that weren't, the great help system we were going to have and all the things. You know, seeing what was in and then what we threw out, that is such, that's the hard thing. Yeah, featureitis is a, is a disease of civilization that only came later on. Yeah. Well, it, it's always. Well, but it's, you, but it's uh, the right uh, mixture. It was a temptation. But, it's well, uh, okay, well, two other little things. One is uh, people are surprised I could write small code with VisiCalc. And the reason is, small code is a stupid thing to write unless you really have to because it's just, you know, it diverts from, you know, making good design decisions. The other... You're also good at sound bites, believe it or not. Well, uh, no, that le that's the lesson learned from Seymour Papert, <laughs> uh, which is a whole other discussion. There are a lot of these discussions I'm not going to hear. But, uh, but the one, one, you know, look at thing, uh, things where they are now is one lesson that has not gotten out is people still tend to view these as appliances. You buy a program, you use it for a purpose, people look at what it is. And one of the lessons of, of the PC industry and stuff is we got an Apple II, we turned it to something else because we have to program it at the edges. We didn't require a big company to do it, didn't wait 
for a corporation to put this feature in. And people, I think, still think of these devices, the cell phone is a perfect example these days, as these fixed products oh, and appliances. And the real, one, one of the real lessons from the PC is the importance of basically getting a chance to add features reinvented the web. We don't, let's see what Tim Ler, Ler, Berners Lee, I keep getting his name reversed, uh, speaks about is that the web was about people doing things at the edges, not about somebody creating these great products. So, you know, Visicog is a useful tool, and people forget it's a programming tool. We just made programming usable, and that's a whole other lecture. Uh, but I really want people to think about not gadgets that they use, but sort of how to reinvent them, sort of what do you learn from them, how do you really create? Well, we'll be able to develop more of these themes uh, during the question period. Be but before I turn to questions from the floor, let's express our appreciation for the very interesting presentation <laughs> from the panel and big hand to Dan, Bob, and Mitch. And we have the volunteers with the mics, and uh, please. Wait, wait for the mic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, another, uh, Ross. <laughs> uh, um, Mitch, correct me if I'm wrong, but if I remember the database. Well, they, people should give their names because, you oh, know. Uh, Rick Ross, I yeah, worked for Mitch. And their crime. The crime. Yes. <laughs> uh, I worked for Mitch on Lotus 1, 2, 3 a long time ago, version 1.0. If I remember the story, uh, first a correction, then a question. The correction, the database was not some brilliant, elegant thing thought out. If I remember correctly, 1, 2, 3 was spreadsheet, Word processing and graphics. The and word more. processor guy we hired from DEC didn't turn out. And you had to give, I don't know if there was a demo do or something, we needed a third feature. So you said to Jonathan, come up with something. And he did the database in a weekend. That's why it's so elegant. Yes. And there had to be, there had to be three features. Oh, by the way, uh, one thing about programming is my rule is if you can't do it over the weekend, it's too complicated. <laughs> so, so the goal is always, OK. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's sort of true. I mean. The, the only difference is I think we'd had the intent of doing a database. It's just that we had this long queue of things and word processing was ahead of it. And the guy who was hired to do it, in fact, didn't work out. Yeah. And so we were playing catch up. Uh, my question is, what do you think is the import of macros, which 1, 2, 3 added to um, VisiCalc? How important uh, were they in the history? Okay. VisiCalc, uh, advanced version, had them too. But right. yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, also, the thing about when I was talking about the things that Mitch, you know, did in ways we would not have done them, there were others, uh, things about scrolling and variable column width and ways he did them that we weren't going to compromise on, and he compromised in a way that turned out to be correct to get the things like out. It wasn't, ju it wasn't just the database. Yeah, like using binary set um, decimal. <laughs> macros, we, VisiCalc was designed, the original VisiCalc 1 was designed for macros. The save format was the keystrokes necessary to recreate it. So you could always write a macro. In fact, we in, did. We had a ver We had, I mean, it, in fact, the way that the demo version of it, which shipped in the summer of, uh, before we shipped it, we sent out this demo version, is it actually took the macros in off of the disk. You would flip the disk over. The, the free version sent out to the, the stores had VisiCalc on one side. They cut the hole on the other side so you could write on <laughs> flip it over. And on the, the other side, side, it had a, it, it had a version of it that was driven by a macro, which was this keystrokes going in. The save format With was additional commands. Yeah, go to here, do this. There were a few extra commands we didn't tell you about unless you subscribe to our publication, uh, the slash x commands uh, that, would, that would move things appropriately. But it had macros that way. And I think that it's, it's key because, you know, programming, I mean, macros have proven everywhere. I mean, look at Unix. I mean, a lot of, you know, macros have always been important. It, it was not just a yeah. feature of the released product. It was a feature no, of VAV. But we, we did, no, the point mistake, is VAV no, no, didn't no, have, well, yeah. came out later. I think the important well, point let's is. Let's just focus on the importance yeah, of sure. macros. It was, in, it, was in, okay, sorry, it was in the specification for version two, <laughs> okay, my, which is my, listed. My observation which, of other people, plus my own use, was that there was a lot of repetitive work, or there could be, and that it just screamed out for some form of automation. And I was uh, ignorant of computer science at that point. And so I didn't, all I could think of was something that could just basically record and play back yeah. the keystrokes. It was the biggest argument that I had with Jonathan Sachs 
who should get the credit because he actually wrote all 89K of the assembly language of the first version, although Rick Ross did design the algorithms for natural order of recalc and implement it. Okay. So he's, he's here, so he has to get credit. Um, <laughs> that's a rule. That's a and rule. There are products of joint authorship yes. that any authors who are in the room yeah. have, yes. have to be recognized. Yeah. Jonathan did not want to implement macros. And he said, I did this once at Data General. I'd written an editor, and it had macros in it. And then people would develop these long things, and they, then they would call me up. <laughs> for technical support on and, oh, oh, uh, and by the way, what, I, wait, 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 Bob, let me finish. Okay. <laughs> I, said, I promise we won't publish your phone number, but you have to put the macros in. And it was really the one time I just insisted because I really thought that it was something that non programmers would use to. Uh, in, in, instead of programming, and it did turn out to be uh, one of the killer features. Yeah, I should say, Rich Landsman did put his phone number in the manual, <laughs> and for years later. <laughs> the next question, please. Tony Mezzapelli, uh, how did Visicorp end up in California, and what's the story be behind Vizion? That I, I think that's yeah. We have the people, yeah, that's, panel, we have the people down here who know it, and I think. Um, <laughs> that's, yeah, I, I think that will be a next question. That, that, I think a, I think it's definitely worth having a whole thing on Visicorp. Yeah, it's it's, it's worth yeah. ha, it's worth having something on Visicorp. Question, some please. other point. Uh, David we got Stork, uh, crime, um, Dan's college roommate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Believe it, so you can't. I don't want you to ask I, questions. I'm not going to tell all those stories. <laughs> <laughs> it's only for one year. <laughs> um, uh, looking back, it must have been really difficult to sell to people who hadn't had personal computers around and uh, can you tell us about the advertising campaign and how you well, that, really educated okay. the public? The um, person who can talk to you a lot about is Ed Esper who's sitting here because he was marketing, head of marketing at, at, at personal software. But um, at first, I can tell you about until we actually released it about some of it. We tried all sorts of things. There was this demo version that was said it would go through a whole demo and tell you what it was doing and all that that would self-run, et cetera. And the, the, these computer stores, a lot of them didn't know what they were doing with it. They just put it there, and they sold the demo. I mean, it was like, yeah. was, they really didn't know what they were doing. But here's what I found out. We went, we went to show it. I remember going with, I think it was with Dan, and we, we went to um, the, the computer store. It's a store that was in, uh, in Massachusetts and Burlington. Yeah. And we went to show that they were like one of the top Apple stores in the country. They became the top Apple store because they knew how to sell VisiCalc. We went to show them the product and they were kind of interested in it. But you know, the answer usually when you showed somebody if they were a computer person, they said, of course a computer can do that. You know, I mean, what's special about that? Uh, you know, I can do that in basic. If you showed it to a regular person, they would say, of course, computers, they can forecast the weather, they can tell the future, what's special? But if you showed it to an accountant and they had they had an accountant there, right? And Joel what? Joel, Joel Skolnick. And Joel Skolnick started shaking. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, come here. This is what I do all day. <laughs> and he showed me his spreadsheets. I can do that in 15 minutes with your thing. That's what happened. There were some people for whom it resonated. I remember, I mean, I've showed people, we showed people demo after demo, and it isn't until we showed them the one that showed their problem that it resonated with them. And those people then became the computer people, like, um, um, you know, you know the, the people who became the computer person within their corporation. And they then started using it and people caught on. Now, some computer people got turned on by what you could do with the computer. You know, of how, I mean, uh, Joel Louis Gasset writes about in his book about how he was at the, um, uh, at a hotel in the uh, bridal suite, you know, under the mirror and all that. And that's where he, Visicalc showed itself to him or something. I was like, <laughs> the, well, you know, he's, Fran he's French, French he's French, and he writes it. <laughs> and he viewed this modeling clay that you can, you know. So each person, you know, got, so that was one. Eventually, the, first, the ads that really worked, um, there were some, HP did some, but uh, I think Radio Shack did, did the ads. They actually showed the sheet of what the output. When you showed people the output, that seems to be the thing. Output is what does it for a lot of things. By the time 123 came on, a lot of people were ready for it and the dealers knew how to sell. Um, Cy Murren would tell stories about how to sell, you know, and he knew how to do that. But that's, that's my stories about it. Any? 
I, well, I mean, the major thing point is, you know, the, do you sell refrigerators to Eskimos or do you sell it to people who want to buy refrigerators? We had, there were enough people who wanted who for whom it resonated that it really became more of an awareness issue. And then they would sell it. But the other important thing, I think, we well, sold a thousand units a month. Yeah, right? where, it got, where people got confused is they confused it with a financial planning tool. They confused it with time series. It was really more the back of an envelope. But it resonated with some class of people first. And the problem is when their products are overly focused on those, like Javelin and then Improv, it sort of became, it, it wound up narrowing the market. So I think the thing was basically, if you're lucky enough to have people to resonate with, and even better, if those people happen on the side to use that to fund an industry, you get a very nice effect. The, 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 can we have the next question, please? Uh, uh, Mitch, uh, you mentioned uh, that one, two, three was Tar this Reigns Cohen. Um, Who also was, uh, well, you can give your, your Vita, but involved. Uh, well, uh, uh, well if I recall, do? doing system administration and doing the development at microfinance systems in the basement yeah. at Central Square. Uh, th that uh, uh, the uh, the, one, the PC uh, was targeted as a platform. I seem to recall setting up a CPM, a Microsoft CPM card in an Apple II as a development platform for Jonathan. That's right. And well, the soft card uh, on the Apple II. Soft, uh, the, on the Apple II. You know two. that I hired Reigns when he was twelve. I was 13. Todd was 12. Todd was he was the developer. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at, at, at the company that was the, the predecessor to Lotus, we, we were um, not sure about the right target platform. Uh, clearly not the Apple II. Uh, we thought maybe the Z80. And there were better development tools or different ones that were available. So, so not a popular PC platform. Yeah, that, that was not the PC. Three Rivers. Different. Well, we, no, we thought of them for develop. We were thinking of them for development platform, but not for a, a target right. platform. Right. And John said, we got to do this right. I, you know, I don't want to write in assembly. We're going to write in C, high level language, easy to maintain. And it was just too slow on that machine. That was the conclusion we came to. It would just not, you know, not uh, meet the speed. And so we were kind of in limbo and until IBM announced the IBM PC in August 81. Questions on the other? Yes? Oh, I'm sorry, the, the mic is, excuse me, the mic is already there. A two-part question. Uh, how did the name Visical come out, and uh, roughly when did the term spreadsheet become uh, a commonly used buzzword? Okay, okay. I'll, since I, okay I'll answer. It's 3 a.m. in the morning. It fix eggs on one oh, on Mass Ave. Uh, put, a, put up my yes. computer. Uh, I was w with Dan Foster discussing it, and, uh, you know, <laughs> Now, look at the word VIX, okay? Well, Go on. Okay. Ah. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, and we, we basically discussed names on Electrolege and stuff, and Visible Calculator was what I, I basically abbreviated as VisiCalc, and because my father had a company named Telematic, which used the M in the middle as a big letter with antennas on it, I capitalized the C. So uh, as a spreadsheet, we'd already thought of it as a spreadsheet, uh, because it was, again, a spreadsheet was not a ledger. That's why I, I didn't want to like the name Electro Ledger, because ledger is too narrow. It was just a sheet spread out, you know, on a table. So that term was always there. The term VisiCalc, it took us a while. It didn't seem natural at first. I remember the next day having dinner at, the, I think, a town restaurant in Arlington Square with, I think Peter was there, you know, trying to, uh, to reconcile, yeah, that's not that bad a name. Now the decision that was made by by Dan, Dan made the decision to go with yes. with the, with Visicalc. We had all these other names. Well, they, they were so bad. Yeah. Well, it was well. But well, we felt it was a spreadsheet. Spreadsheet's been around for hundreds of years. But it, it wasn't called it in the early documentation. I don't right. Think. Yeah. No. Yes, the manuals w which had phrases like, you'll destroy the world if you make this mistake. But that's another discussion. Next question, please. Hi, my name is Ted Goldstein. I'm curious, what can you say about your relationship with uh, Apple Computer and how it progressed from good to bad to better to worse? Um, the, the first version... Well, actually, actually, Peter should yeah. start up by talking about his demo to Markle. Yeah. <laughs> the, the first version of it uh, that sort of ran, uh, written in Assembler, that Bob wrote early 
like the first week well, or so well, of the first January. Six, six weeks of program. Yeah, January of, of 79, Dan brought out to show Apple. And actually, uh, Peter was, Peter's one of you. You were at the, the meeting? No, he did the demo. You're the one who did the demo, yes. And what did Markle say? Can, can Wait, hold on, we're getting a. Mike here. Mike's over there. No, Peter's over there. <laughs> <laughs> I can't resist. It's, it's just one of, those, one of those interesting stories because um, I, I went to Consumer Electronics Show and from there to Sunnyvale and the question that was asked about Visicorp moving to California, I came to California to get office space, et cetera. And on that visit, I went to Apple and uh, attempted to demonstrate VisiCalc to Mike Markula, <coughs> who was chairman of Apple. And uh, no problem at all. We had a, a very good meeting, and I did a, a quick demo, and the usual profit and loss statement, typical Harvard Business School uh, case. And uh, he sort of said, yeah, that's fine. Now let me show you something very interesting. Uh, last night in, in Apple Basic, I programmed a uh, checkbook program. And he proceeded to demonstrate the program that he had just written in Basic. Uh, and which he was very excited about because I don't think he'd ever written a program before. So he just learned how to program. <laughs> and as a result of that, uh, uh, he, he wasn't, I tried to explain that VisiCalc could be a, a checkbook as well, but uh, somehow he just never got the <laughs> point. Yeah. I, uh, and I remember. Uh, Can one I add one little note to that? Yes. Yeah. I joined. Uh, uh, name, name. I'm Rich yeah. Melman. Uh, I, I joined uh, VisiCorp fairly early in the company's history, but not as early as the rest of these guys. But on my first day on the job, Steve Jobs came to see me and said, um, Rich, we're going to clone VisiCalc and put it for free in every computer, and we'll make you a deal. We'll give you a buck a copy. And we threw him out of the office, and they never did clone it because it's very hard to clone that product. Uh, Frankston's 20K bytes memory space that that thing runs in really kept almost everybody else from knocking off. At except least for a while. Yeah. Except for those that actually made real copies. Yeah, Rich so is right. <laughs> yeah. We and sure as hell tried. No, uh, well, same uh, thing uh, happened with one, two, three. The, 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 relationship, the relationship was amazingly contentious considering the fact yes. that VisiCalc absolutely made Apple computers. Yeah, one yeah, one thing surprised me is how long it took people to clone VisiCalc. Basically yeah. two years <laughs> before there was a real clone. And even the first one, SuperCalc, Dan stupidly pointed out, by the way, guys, you forgot to use the arrow keys. Yeah. I didn't get a chance to pull right. him back in time. But, but, uh, yeah. you know, but so it is an interesting question of, of for a simple in a sense obvious idea, Ooh, why did it take ad. so long? Uh, I remember the other Apple thing is that Dan Feilstra seemed enamored by Apple. He was just everything about Apple he really was into, you know. Uh, th that's his eyes saw at the envy. time. He, you know, of course he ended up with the same investors, the same accountants, uh, mm -hmm. the, the cool things that Apple was able to do to make sure they had the, um, the disk drives. And Vizion. So, and moving even nearby. Uh, so that was, and we ended up doing, now the reason we ended up on the Apple first part of it was, you know, that was the one we had. 65, which could have been on another one. No, they had, they had all the floppy drives tied up. Because, but they had the floppy drives tied up. <laughs> and there was a spare one available yeah, for us to Peter program. Was, Peter was in the other right. Next question, please. Uh, Tom Moran, formerly of TeamMaker. Uh, in the uh, ink uh, thing, it mentioned some of the early yes. competitors. What reasons do you think both on a, the product VisiCalc took over and also the style of spreadsheet of VisiCalc? <sighs> You'd have to ask the users, I think. I mean, first of all, we did get out there in time. We had, we had people, I mean, all these Harvard and, and other place MBAs were doing their job, right? Um, you know, uh, and good investors. I mean, I, part but, of it, you have to ask, Ed, did you have a feel why you were able, were able to knock off? I mean, now some of it is the, remember, we were aiming it. Well, actually, okay, as okay. a product yeah. manager. Well, they, I mean, <laughs> just for reasons that mystified me, the other products that came out, were kind of spreadsheets, but they were sort of crude copies that just wound up getting one thing or another like really wrong. Like context MBA was god awfully slow. How about the earlier, the earlier like right. TeamMaker and well, but they were just um, the they were they were just minutes. imitative in ways that they didn't have the kind of the crispness or the elegance. They just didn't work as well for you. And then there was a whole lot of momentum brand momentum behind VisiCalc. It had Mystique, it was the software, you know, dog, software tail that wagged the hardware dog, and Ben <laughs> Rosen, who was the most influential analyst, got behind it, and it wrote on that. Apple's um, charisma. And so the other 
Here's, here's um, the other thing, of course, is that Apple really was a consumer machine. The CPM machines weren't. You couldn't just go and buy them and set them up. You had to do fiddling. The only things you could just run were the Apple II, the Commodore PET, and the TRS-80. Yeah. But the PET and the TRS-80 as consumer machines were just in, you know, inferior in terms of capability and experience. But, uh, it uh, also but was very fat. I mean, keystroke, no, keystroke minim, I mean, yeah. it was like a video game, and the keystroke minimization made a difference. I mean, I was aiming against the back of the envelope. My goal was the following. The first time you would do something, you'd use VisiCalc. This is literally the goal I was at, because if I didn't get you doing it, if it was too hard to do the first time, you wouldn't get the benefit the second time. You did, you did the recalc. So I was trying to make it easier than using your calculator, at least the same and no more keystrokes than necessary for stuff. And that did make some difference. I, I think the fact is that VisiCalc was intentionally designed, not simply architected or programmed, which is to say, as you heard, a lot of thought went into, well, what should the user experience be? How should it work? At a time when not only was that not the norm, but you could even get scorn from your fellow programmers if you had extended conversations about that because you didn't talk about users, you talked about losers, right. as, as the yeah. terminology, <laughs> and, um, but, not and, and, but it line. turned out that doing things for regular folks who weren't programmers was where the market was, and Dan just gave that tons and tons and tons of thought, and it showed in the product. I, I think you also, it was uh, just a, the, a quick point, and this is what I mentioned about improv, it was not really a time series program, it was not a planning tool, it was just scratch paper that helped yes. you. It, it gave you the, f the, the free dimensions, but gave you a, a, a grid of some sort. That com some people went too far in the two dimensions, and some people went too far in the grid. And it, plus, if the other ones had been number one, they'd be up here. But you guys have two models. <laughs> I mean, you know, in an alternate universe. You, know. you have two models to mention, that, that both, both Visicalc and 1, 2, 3 were damn fast. And I think that made a lot of difference. Well, damn fast, except for the st my mistake of doing decimal. No, it, it would have been faster. You see, <laughs> oh, okay. it would yeah. have been faster if we had, had a different Apple II, because the <laughs> RC cert, we tuned it to the speed of the, that particular Apple II. Next question, please. Not only was it fast, but it didn't crash very much. Um, yeah. I'm Liza Loop, and I met <laughs> these three guys. <laughs> yeah. A uh, long time ago, I was, I think, the 17th employee at Personal Software. Mm -hmm. Don't forget that the company that did the marketing was Personal Software. Yes. It became Visicorp because of Visicalc. Mm -hmm. But we were asking questions about what's, you know, how it was advertised and what sold it. It sold itself. We had people walking into the uh, <laughs> Personal Software at Cole Park um, saying, I need three more copies of the, I need three more discs, but don't, don't give me that manual. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they like the reference card? They like the reference card. Yes. The reference card was great, but don't give, me <laughs> don't give me the manual. I got to write the, the second manual. Yeah. Well, you read, wrote the fourth manual. The first, I wrote the first, that was, and then the second one was written by a famous writer in our industry. Um, <laughs> and then the third one was written by Dan, uh, Dan Feilster, to get just to get it out the door. And that was the one that got out. It wasn't that bad. <laughs> but it was depends on when you were talking to the user. The reference card, which my father printed. These are I can show you how it went. But the <laughs> reference card, the sketch of this picture on the back that told you all the pieces. Well, Dan, does, you took does the, the picture. reference card relate to the design of the program? It was a great oh, it, it, it was crucial. Yeah. In fact, oh, yes, okay. Leading question. Thank you very much. By the way, Dan, did you take the picture for this right? Yes, I took the pictures. I'm always <laughs> into photography. I use my long lens and the whole bit. This the reference Mike, card. Mike. Oh, well, I always do that. Mike? Here. By the way, it, you know, this really is Wait, the, is do, do it okay. in your okay. attic, okay. Okay. not okay. garage Sorry. thing, but okay. it's, you know, everything done yourself, whereas the whole idea now is you get the design people and you hire these people and you hire those people. This is what the reference card focus looked like. Typed with a correcting selectric typewriter. You can see my corrections. Uh, yeah, uh, this this is, is on the 3rd of January. I <laughs> kept, we rented one of these. I borrowed from Bob and then we rented one. And constantly I would update this reference card along with a manual that was in that style of, I, we called it a calculator. At least I called it at first, so it's CL. So you could see, you know, told you how to do it. And this was the spec. So, but basically the reference card started out as something like this, which was the spec and then turned into, this was the reference card in June of 1979 when we announced it at the West Coast, at the National Computer Conference in New York City. 
And this is, there's actually a copy of a little later one up on the website. But that, in that plaque, they have this pic a sketch of this picture that I found on the back of something from Harvard. And it explained all the different stuff. It even had graphing oh. and stuff. Oh, I need to add that to my write-up. But it, here's the spec. You know, it told you all the stuff. It was really into different fonts and stuff like that. You used a, a lot of them. That's, and that seemed to work. People said they were able to learn from it. And this is a discipline. We couldn't explain the reference card. We didn't, we changed the program. Yeah. Next question, please. Okay, um, Eort Mante, just user. Um, you mentioned how um, you went up the food chain at, uh, at Apple. Uh, something similar must have happened at IBM that people were gradually starting to take note and waking up. Could you describe that a little? We'll have a little bit help from the, this. This is a, from the original batch of, from the original, the first shipment of VisiCalc for the IBM PC. Okay, the guys from, uh, from IBM came to us and said, we need VisiCalc. And we said, great, we have a deal. Go on out there and go do a deal with it. And we did a version for it. Now, what I understand it is that when Don Estridge went to demonstrate the um, a PC, well, it was a, I guess it was an Apple II or something, or maybe it was his version, running on the IBM PC to senior management. Some of them already knew how to use VisiCal, <laughs> is the story he told me, uh, which is, so there was knowledge of that. They, they really understood the Apple II, so much so that they said no Apple II had much more than 64K of memory, so that there was no reason for them to expect there to be more than 64K memory and on an IBM PC. And they copied some of the mistakes in the stupid PC board interface. But uh, the negotiations were really tough about how to do it. The, the right, you made the right decision at, at VisiCorp to keep the development in-house. I know to keep the sales, to sell it yourself also, not just IBM selling it. Talk to Ed, I was gone. Yes. Oh, you were going at that point, yes? Yeah. Uh, uh, is that enough, or, yeah? Uh, next, qu next question. So my name is Yo, uh, I'm Yoichi Hariguchi, and um, actually I have an experience, like uh, when I was a stu uh, college student, like uh, uh, our laboratory didn't have like a PC, but uh, we had Unix, and uh, I, ha I had to, I mean, write a lot of program to use Oak. <laughs> to just do the same thing like um, physical kind of Lotus 1, 2, 3 could and I said, oh, why do I have to write like so much program to do, I mean, the same thing like uh, with just one command. So the, uh, my question is like, uh, when you wrote Lotus 1, 2, 3 or physical, did you know the existence of Oak, a uh, repo generator on Unix? And the, did you think about the, uh, it could be like uh, uh, your, this kind of approach could be your competitor? Um, when I was designing it, I was taking, we were building it, I was taking a course about computer stuff at Harvard. And one of the things is we got to look at all these financial forecasting systems. Bob will talk about the ones he worked with. We were familiar with financial forecasting report systems. VisiCalc was successful because it was not a financial forecasting system. It was a two-dimensional grid like a word. It was a blank slate that you, people didn't just put things in a strict way. They put here, here. Things would grow as you would write it. And that free form that -ness is important, different than a report generator, which we were aware of. And, you know, that seems to be a, a thing to understand is the simple general purpose tools. You know, I mean, simple IP connectivity. I mean, things like that seem to win out over other things. Yeah, as I said, but, the improv story, we were very, of course, aware of Unix because we'd worked on Multics, which is the real thing. Um, well, why, Unix is one of what Multics no, is many uh, Unix was, was, was the same. Those people had worked on Unless Multics. Unless you change the fact. spelling, I mean something. Uh, and the, it, it was a joke name based on Multics. Yeah. I mean, so it really was. I mean, I appreciate the good, the, you know. We have a whole long story in that. I have a long story. You know, I also worked on a financial, a thing called FFL, First Financial Language, designed by Butler Lampson. And I did the implementation of the SDS 940 back in 1966. So we had, you know, and I worked at Interactive Data, which sold time series stuff, or t time series analysis online, with why, you know, when Mitch did um, what became, um, Microtrain, was that what you call it? Micro Micro troll. Troll. Yeah. Tiny, you know, tiny troll, tiny uh, troll, tiny troll, tiny troll. Oh, we got a you know, of we, we, it, it was very familiar from the you know IDC experience, and that's why VisiCalc was really n it could do that, 
but that was really not the purpose. Here's, if Maybe you go to the, the screen, last, there's MFS. That's the last the question, program. please. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I'm another one of Brad Templeton, and uh, um, I was one of the earliest employees of personal software, as you mentioned. Um, and VisiCal changed my life, as, as uh, Mitch said. I think there's a lot of people in this room who can say that. I wanted to reiterate uh, just an amusing anecdote from the introduction of VisiCal. Uh, Peter Jennings gave me my first demo, and, and I did get very excited about it right away. But then Peter and I and some others demoed it to the crowd at the National Computer Conference in 1979. Um, in New York, and um, yeah, a lot of people just, they walked by, they didn't understand at all what the program was, and what the interesting thing I wanted to uh, point out was I saved the program book from that conference, oh. and the keynote address was titled, Personal Computing, Is It Worth It? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, by the way, at the, I, I gave a talk on this. Is it on the web? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, the by the way, if you have a copy of the talk, I'm trying to find it. Uh, the, uh, uh, nobody came uh, to that talk except for friends, and some people, and Whit Diffie was one of the people slightly, oh, yes. yes. My, si my, my, my sister in law here. Uh, okay, and Whit, Whit Diffie, by the way, happened to have come to that one. So that's where I first met him, none of the crypto stuff then. But the talk people really were interested in, in, in was the other talk of, of the session I was sharing with, was the uh, undocumented uh, operators for the TI 59 calculator. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. This concludes tonight's uh, uh, evening. Thank you for coming.